yes, a lovely evening to you all. Thank you so much for joining us on the market, farmers market today. Uh, we are the Africa Agriculture Network, and uh, we are going to be having a wonderful discussion today on food safety and uh, specifically tackling the issue of AFLA toxins. I request us, if you have a colleague, a friend you know, uh, now is a good time to reach out to them and tell them that the space you've been waiting for is about to start. At the moment, we will have... Uh, some information being shared with all of us and uh, this is to give us a brief on who we are as Africa Agriculture Network. In case you're interfacing with us for the first time, we want to be able to help you understand who we are, what we're all about and uh, in a short while, once we have all our guest speakers online, we'll be starting off with our discussion. So, First of all, my name is Jafet Nabikamba, who will be moderating today's uh, X space. And um, I am part of Africa Agriculture Network, which is an online content house specializing in creating agricultural content within Uganda and African continent at large, with the purpose of educating, showcasing success stories, and building a community of passionate farmers globally. The content is shared as segmented episodes through some of our programs that include Nkumbi Telimba and Did You Know, utilizing social media platforms to inform, teach, and inspire farmers in Africa to improve and increase yields of their farm produce by sharing success stories of other farmers and practical solutions to addressing challenges faced by the agricultural sector. AN was launched in 2020 by Moving Ads, and uh, it's uh, Moving Ads is a video production and digital marketing company. And uh, this is to see that we provide a resource to address the knowledge gap within the sector and also help the youth see and tap into the vast opportunities that agribusiness provides. So that is who Africa Agriculture Network is. And uh, we are the ones responsible for organizing the space that you're going to be enjoying this evening. I see that a number of us have joined in. I'd like to welcome very much, Kevin. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I welcome Arnold. Thank you so much for joining us. I see Jabba, um, Alex, Se Sebatuka. Thank you so much for joining us. I see also Serrano. Thank you so much for joining us. I believe that... Um, Within a short while, we should be able to get started. If you want to get yourself a cup of coffee, given the weather, it's cold where I'm seated. Uh, it's a beautiful breeze coming in. I'm right here at the Ndere Center. And uh, I believe that anyone who is experiencing the weather today, a cup of coffee would be absolutely amazing for you. So who we are as Africa Culture Network, I've just told you, we're a content house. And we're looking at how do we get more youth and more people benefiting from the information that we've been able to gather from different farmers that have managed to walk the journey of farming successfully. Yes. And um, our discussion today is uh, on aflatoxins. I'm sure that many of us have probably had in the newspaper aflatoxins being talked about. And we have not fully gone deep into understanding how aflatoxins affect all of us or how they could affect all of us. And that is what we are going to be doing on tonight's space. I was reading somewhere... I was reading somewhere... Uh, I was reading somewhere and aflatoxins can be passed on in a number of ways. And uh, this could be through the crops such as maize, peanuts, cotton seed, and tree nuts, but also they could be through the animal meat that we eat. If those animals fed on crops that have been contaminated in one way or another uh, by a fungi that causes aflatoxins, they could definitely be affected as well. 
Okay, so. On this evening's X Space, we have three wonderful guests. Uh, before I get into sharing bits about who they are, um, okay, we have three wonderful guests. One of them is Agnes Chirabo, Executive Director of uh, Food Rights Alliance. Uh, then we have Council David Kabanda, who is Executive Director of the Food Center of the Center for Food and Adequate Living Rights. And then we have Professor Akileo Kaya uh, with a PhD in food science and technology. I know that uh, we are being joined by a fourth guest uh, who is none other than uh, Mr. Mr. Arnold Rabogo who is the Operations Director of Reco Industries Limited. And uh, he holds uh, that position of Operations Director and possesses expertise in nutrition and food safety systems accredited by FAO. Additionally, he's an active member of the Uganda Green Council. So, Arnold Rabogo and uh, Professor, Professor Achileo Kaya, and Council David Kabanda are uh, our speakers this evening. Do we have any of them online as yet? Let's see. Good evening. This is Arnold. Yes, Arnold. Yes, I am online. Awesome, awesome. Good to have you, Mr. Arnold Rabogo. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. So just to, to just to help everyone get to the place of understanding the work that you do, can you briefly tell us about it? Okay, thank you. Again, my name is Arnold uh, Rabogo, and I work with uh, Reco Industries Limited. It's a food processing company and we work directly with farmers and farmer groups and cooperatives. We do farmer trainings. We do farm inputs for farmers and we also buy back product, produce from farmers. Some of the products that we work with are got from groundnuts, maize and soya bean. So we process those into flour, we make soya porridge, we make maize meal, fortified, and we also make a product called rutafa. It's a therapeutic food for the severely malnourished people. Uh, and in my work, I work with about 4,000 farmers directly within groups. And uh, we've been, I've been doing this for the past 12 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anod, for that brief and uh, elaborate explanation of what TRECO does. Um, I believe that value addition is the way to go. Do we have Council David Kabanda online? Council David Kabanda, are you online? Uh, do we have Professor Akileo Kaya? Okay. So... Uh, we'll carry on the discussion with uh, Mr. Arnold Rabogo, uh, who is available at the moment as the other guest speakers join us. We want to understand this issue of aflatoxins. And um, like I said earlier in the introduction, when I was reading about aflatoxins, it was uh, interesting to note that it's not just about the maize that many times we hear being publicized in the news, but it can actually be transferred to animals. So maybe to help all of us understand what are aflatoxins and how do aflatoxins develop and why are they a concern in the food supply? Mr. Anna Drabogo. No, thank you very much. Um, to begin with, aflatoxins 
are a group of uh, myotoxin. They originate from fungus. So the fungus excretes the toxins. Uh, the type of fungus is Aspergillus uh, flavius. So this fungus excretes the toxins into our food. And what causes this fungus to, to be active in our food? It's usually molding. So maize, groundnuts, if they seem molded, there's a likelihood that they are affected with aflatoxin. Not only maize and groundnuts, but also other products. It could be cassava. Many of the things that we plant, keep in the garden, harvest later, or we can plant and store poorly, as long as the product, the produce is wet, uh, the moisture creates an atmosphere for the production of the fungus, hence excreting aflatoxins. Why is it a concern? It's a concern because one, health, and two, for the economy. Health-wise, the toxins affect the liver. Um, the job of the liver is to clean the blood system. So when you bring in toxins into your body, the liver is hard pressed to remove these toxins and you're affecting the liver directly. It can cause uh, liver cancer. Actually, it causes liver cancer. And what are the symptoms of a bad liver? If you've seen some people with um, yellow eyes, it may not be a aflatoxin, but it just shows that the liver is either damaged or working very hard. It could be due to the toxins, could be due to over-medication, could be due to alcohol, but you're overworking the liver and then you have the yellow eyes. And as you said earlier, it's not just the human that are affected by these toxins. The toxins can come from, um, for example, the maize flour. Many of us in Uganda, are, we feed our dogs with portion. A dog can also get aflatoxin infection. Uh, recently, I've heard of dogs becoming skinny, go to the vet, and they're diagnosed with liver failure. Most likely, it's because of aflatoxins. So aflatoxins are caused by mold, and it affects us, um, by the, it affects the liver directly. Yes. Thank you very much, Anod. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anod, for that uh, elaborate explanation as to how aflatoxins come about and how they affect us. Do we have Professor Akileo Kaya online and uh, Kaso David Kabanda? Okay. If not, uh, I would like to just make a comment on what you've just said. I, I feel like a large part of what we are seeing today is uh, because of a lack of information. And uh, it's good that forums like Africa Agriculture Network are stepping in to provide information to farmers, but also the would-be consumers of agriculture products. Because uh, until you get to hear of things like aflatoxins uh, and read about them, you may not fully appreciate how any of us could be affected by them. And that leads me to asking our next question, which is, which crops are affected by, uh, by aflatoxins? I know you mentioned some of them, but also what, uh, what regions, all types of crops are most susceptible to aflatoxin contamination and why? Maybe in this case, you would elaborate more on why it is that uh, those particular crops you mentioned, I heard you mentioning groundnuts, you mentioned maize. Why is it that those particular crops are easily susceptible to aflatoxins? Okay, uh, that's a bit scientific, but it's true. Groundnuts and maize are mostly affected by aflatoxin. But because we have dealt with soya bean, the chances of having aflatoxin in soya bean are much less than groundnuts and maize. The science behind that, I am not quite sure but it has to do with storage conditions. Uh, lately, 
maize and groundnuts have become commercial crops. I think a long time ago they used to be food food crops. So because we are producing and storing these products, um, one of the causes is moisture. If you stored your produce in a room, even if the produce didn't have aflatoxin at the time, but now because of the our weather in Uganda, we'd have heat by day and cold by night, that fluctuation may cause condensation. And th when the, this water comes in contact with the produce, the fungus will start to grow. Uh, Region-wise, the tropics are more susceptible to aflatoxin again because of our weather. If we were in a cooler climate, up on Mount Renzori or the Northern Hemisphere, the chances might be less because it's always cool. But because of the condition that we are in, our climate, we're susceptible to a lot of moisture in our food because of that hot and cold. So yes, uh, maize, groundnuts, cassava, uh, even the chilies. We've had problems with chili, the chilies being affected by aflatoxin. Um, thank you, Jafat. Can I add on? This is Professor Kaya. Yes, please. Yes, Professor Kaya, please. Uh, thank you very much. I want to thank the previous speaker. Uh, and I'm sorry I came in late because we were trying to use another um, method of communication. You know, um, uh, in nature we have uh, two types of molds. There are those molds which love uh, high moisture content foods. And they normally cause the uh, plant diseases when the when the, when the crop is seen in the field. You know the moisture content is quite high, and then it can be infected by those molds uh, or fun and fungi. But there are those molds which love low moisture content food. You know they are scientifically known as the xerophytes. So you find out that the, um, uh, maize, uh, uh, groundnuts, uh, you know, uh, soybean, cassava, and the uh, all those, you know, uh, produce that are dried are mainly uh, contaminated by aflatoxins because the molds that produce aflatoxins, you know, they survive under low moisture content foods. So when you reduce moisture content to the optimum levels where these molds can survive better, which is the moisture content between uh, um, 15 and the 25 uh, percent, they, they, then these molds start growing. So that's the biggest challenge that you have. And then also, the structure of the commodity matters a lot. In most cases, they love, um, to some extent, uh, you know, commodities that have got uh, um, uh, that are high, a little bit in protein and also a little bit in, uh, in oil. Although, uh, uh, as, my, as the previous speaker said, even cassava, you know, dried cassava, you can find aflatoxins. But the chances are more higher in maize and groundnuts you know, those which have got oil and a little bit of protein than those commodities that don't have a lot of protein. So that's the explanation that can be given uh, scientifically. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I see Council David Kavanda has also joined us. Would you like to supplement on what Professor and uh, Mr. Robogo have just shared? Thank you so much, um, dear listeners, uh, members of the space. Um, what Professor Kaya has said, I, I can't add anything from a scientific part uh, point of view. Um, if if we have those molds on on our crops, and maybe what I can only add is, it why this thing is. Uh, too much of a problem is in most cases you will not see them by your naked eyes so you might be drinking milk uh, eating chicken if it fed on you know um, products that are contaminated you'll also be eating them we love pancakes and uh, I have not known uh, clean drying structures for uh, cassava 
all the cassava that you see being dried you see that it has it has molds on it so i think uh, i'll stop here for now then we can discuss uh, more uh, issues related to legal okay uh, thank you so much uh, mr <laughs> council david kabanda you mentioned kavalagala and uh, you hit uh, you hit very many of us because this is a delicacy that we we widely enjoy here in uganda and um, later on probably we need to understand how we can be able to protect ourselves from uh, you know aflatoxins that could easily come even through the things we love like kavalagala but for now we want to help a farmer who is listening in right now Um, we could uh, have any of you going first in response to that, but maybe let's go with Professor first. Professor. No, uh, I'm sorry I didn't hear the question very well. If you can repeat for me. Okay, so Professor. Wow, See, I'm breaking. No, I can't. Sorry, I can't hear. Farmer, that there. Professor, did you hear the question? No, I did not. Um, I also didn't hear. I had part of the question. I think your network might be low. I think you're trying to ask how how can we help the farmer to understand if they have aflatoxin? Okay, so let me ask the question again. How can a farmer know that their produce has aflatoxins and how can they prevent the problem okay thank you very much uh, i hope you can hear me now uh, there's no way a farmer will tell that the uh, uh, produce has got aflatoxins or not because as the previous speaker said aflatoxins do not smell nor can be visible with the naked eye. Actually, they appear in any food stuff in very minute quantities, very, very. That's why we talk about parts per billion. So you can imagine those are parts per billion, the same as micrograms per kilogram. So in most cases, we use uh, signs. When you see maize or granules or cassava having molds, and not all molds, remember, not all molds cause aflatoxin. There are molds which do not cause aflatoxin. There are molds which do not produce any mycotoxins. Like the bread mold, you know, bread would always forms those molds. Those molds don't actually um, cause uh, toxins. They don't produce toxins. They just spoil it. They just spoil the, the, the bread. But in most cases, in communities like maize, ground nuts, when they have actually, uh, when they have symptoms of, uh, you know, disease, symptoms of decay, symptoms of rotting, chances could be that they are contaminated with aflatoxins. Uh, uh, although we have also uh, isolated the, um, and analyzed the aflatoxins eh, from maize and bananas, which look sound, which look actually good, because the mold could have contaminated the, the, the grains much earlier. It dies, but it leaves the toxins behind. So there's no way you can be bad if you are if you see signs of decay or rotting or discoloration of this grains that the discoloration must be related to mold contamination chances could be that they are having aflatoxin and therefore sorting is one of the the ways you know of reducing aflatoxins from the grains yeah Um, can I add on? Thank you, Professor. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, go ahead. Professor Kaya is correct. Sorry, Professor Kaya, yes, correct, because you can't see them with your naked eye. But um, as a farmer, if you're a large scale farmer, you can have your grain tested. 
Um, there are testing labs. We have UNBS and UNBS affiliate labs. They can test the grain for you, and they will be able to let you know if it's affected or not. But this might not be for every small-scale farmer because of the availability and the price. I think the last time I checked uh, to test one sample of maize goes for about 250000 So you can go to the government lab, you can go to UNBS or any other lab. It costs about that much. So if you are a small-scale farmer, you may not be able to. But for the large-scale farmers who, who supply in hundreds of tons, that would be an option to know that they have aflatoxin in their produce. Maybe I can come in to add. Um, yes, counsel. I think um, how farmers can know and how can they be helped. A professor can, can give us more enlightenment, but reading shows that some aflatoxins are even in the soil. So I think testing your produce is at the... Uh, is at the tail end. It is like uh, you are curing, yet you, you are supposed to have prevented. Because take an example, if a farmer has harvested 10 bags of maize, and he or he does a sample, and they find that the, the his or her maize is contaminated, you see that it is already a problem. So I think what needs to be done is also the... Uh, the the soil maybe professor can come back on that uh, issue of the soil but for us i think farmers yes i clearly understand you prof when you say that not every mold but it would be safer for a farmer not to allow molds hmm? because i think much of the problem comes from our uh, our our ignorance, that is number one. Then number two, uh, aflatoxins do not kill you immediately. Then number three, um, we think that we are pushing the problem. Then number four, our poor and uh, poor, illegal, irresponsible uh, practice. Because... We take an example of, 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 of coffee. You know how everyone has been crying about coffee. Don't, you know, dry the coffee on, on the ground. Why on earth would a farmer cut cassava and they just expose it, you know, in, in, in the cold? Some, some farmers dry their cassava on the road, alongside the road. So you look at some of the things. So I think... And by the way, if, if traders, uh, maybe I, I, this is, I'm, I'm going too fast, too uh, fast than I'm, I'm supposed to be. If farmers start getting some losses due to aflatoxins, now they'll learn to, 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 to practice safer and responsible practices. That is the contribution that I wanted to make, you know, as far as the farmer is concerned. Okay. I want to uh, ask Councillor David uh, Kabanda, what are some of those safer practices that farmers can practice? Again, Professor Kaya can come back here, but one of the safer practices, uh, don't harvest and then live in the garden. Some farmers have a practice when they are uh, harvesting maize, they cut it and they leave it in the garden. By the way, even plucking it, they pluck it off. These, these days, um, they, they hire these machines. But they do it in the garden. You understand? Then secondly, storage. Someone brings um, the produce and they just put it down without putting up pellets such that they keep it, you know, above the ground then um uh, harvesting time some farmers when they are harvesting they don't care if it is raining or it is not 
they'll just harvest. And, and, and I think that exposes the produce to all these conditions that are favoring the molds to grow and eventually the, 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 the aflatoxins. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor David. Yes. Can I come? Can I yes. add on? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, uh, thank you very much, moderator. That was uh, a very good question. Uh, what we are encouraging farmers to do is to practice what we call good agricultural practices, good agronomic practices. This involves right away from seed selection, that you use a clean, clean seed, good seed, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, preparing, preparing your, your field very well. To, uh, then you do the right spacing, you do the right management of uh, these pests and diseases, then, if possible, you get because the drought is one of the biggest challenges. Why actually groundnuts and maize are contaminated with aflatoxins? Is it, well, all that we are aiming at when we talk about good agricultural practices is to raise a crop that is healthy, such that it is not susceptible to mold attack. Because for some of these produce, aflatoxin, you know, our production of, or mold, you know, contamination starts from the field. So, um. Just like a, um, uh, what the Council of has mentioned, if you if you don't time the harvesting period and you leave the produce, you know, like the farmers do, leave maize to dry in the uh, uh, in the field, that's now uh, one way of exposing maize to the dangers of afla toxins. So uh, the purpose of good agricultural practices is to raise the healthy crop. Just like you want to raise a, a, a healthy baby. A little baby will have less chances of being affected by some of these common diseases. So this is exactly what we are uh, aiming at. So do time planting, do timely harvesting of your produce, and then ensure that immediately you harvest, you dry. And then drying should be off the ground. Now, the challenge of drying, of course, sometimes we don't blame our farmers. Because it is recommended that if you are going to control aflatoxins, just like it is done in the U.S., you have to dry your produce within 24 to 48 hours. So this business of using the open sun drying method, you know, promotes aflatoxin contamination because they they, they dry today, in the morning they take it, they produce out, take it take it back, and then the moisture content is the slowly getting, you know. Um, of in other words, the produce is drying slowly, and once it dries slowly, they, you can reach a critical moisture content when the molds can grow very fast. And remember, we are in the tropics; the temperatures are suitable for the growth of the molds, and then the, that critical moisture content can be reached. And if you don't dry faster, then it becomes a serious problem. When you go to countries like Rwanda, you know where they have cooperatives, the cooperatives can mobilize or can pool resources and acquire some of these mobile dryers. So the members of the so some cooperatives can dry, you know, uh, grains, maize especially, using these mobile dryers within 48, 48 hours. These things actually can be managed. You know, I think we need to be uh, much more serious. So uh, after drying um, uh, off the ground and drying, you know, as fast as possible, storage should be also done as per the recommendations. So some people heap maize uh, or groundnuts, you know, in the stores, on, on the floor, you know, and then it picks up more moisture. The, the stores that we use are not the ones which are recommended. You know, they are not ventilated. It is, and you know these problems, these challenges. So now there's no way we are going to avoid the aflatoxin contamination as long as we don't practice the recommendations. And then some of these recommendations are really very, very uh, easy. Only that sometimes our farmers don't want to suffer a lot. If you see what is happening nowadays, maize is left to dry in the field, and it is shelled in the field, and it's bagged in the field, and the traders transport it directly without further drying, which is a very serious mistake that we are doing right now. And if you if you mill that kind of maize which, which has got a lot of moisture content, remember, by the time maize is shelled, uh, if it is done in the field, the moisture content is about 20 percent, and that's the suitable you know moisture content for the molds to grow. 
So if you don't do further drying before milling it into flour, that's why sometimes you find the flour being contaminated. Yeah, thank you very much. Arnold, uh, would yes. you like to come in here as well? Yes, uh, Professor Kaya is right. Um, but see, on the side of, because the best way would have been to properly dry the maize and store in a proper condition. The post-harvest handling practices that the professor mentioned. But I think we have a problem, our farmers, it's, yes, there's one lack of awareness, but there's also an aspect of poverty. Um, many of the stores are not proper. You may find them leaking. That's one thing. Also, as a farmer, he may not choose to dry his produce to the recommended percentage. Why? The drier the produce, the less money is going to make because of weight. So you'll find some farmers, typically a company might want to buy at 13%, but a, a farmer may have his at about 16% because the water weight adds to his uh, income. So that, that is also another issue that, um, that we face as, as traders and as farmers. It's hard to get the correct percentage of water, of water moisture from the produce itself. But for the farmer that really, really wants to avoid aflatoxin, there are other methods like airtight containers. Uh, there are some that were distributed on discount by a World Food Program. There are mini silos. I think in Uganda you can get them from Steel and Tube and from uh, some other companies. So if you can afford, these silos are airtight, so they can help keep your produce at a certain moisture level and free from contaminants. Thank you. Okay, I know. Thank you. Yes, um, Professor. Yes, Professor. Yes. Yes, I was saying that in addition to what he was saying, the, we have pig bags, which have been uh, which are easy and actually affordable, you know, um, compared to the the silos he was, he was he was talking about. And these pig bag, pig bags, uh, exclude the air, as you said, because these molds, uh, you know, are aerobic, uh, scientifically, they, they 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 like they, they survive under oxygen conditions. So if you cut off oxygen, you tend to cut off um uh, the, the the later which they can actually grow and multiply. And besides the insect infestation also has been found to promote mold infection. Because insects uh, uh in addition to creating avenues, you know, those holes which they create for them, uh, which can allow molds to enter, they also move along with the spores. So once once you, you prevent insects by excluding air you also try to exclude aflatoxin contamination. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Professor. There's uh, something you mentioned that I found very fascinating. You said that one way to avoid aflatoxins is one, timely planting, two, timely harvesting, and then you mentioned drying the plants, at the, the harvest at the right time, but off the ground. And when you say right time, you meant within 48 hours after harvest. What I see here is that uh, we have a case of probably people not being informed, but also we are still stuck to what has worked in the past years, still being the thing we still look to, to being able to help us have our farming or agriculture practice going on. Now, we need to now move on to the side of the consumers. How can we, me who goes to the shelf, supermarket shelf, and buys uh, my favorite type of kalo, my favorite type of maize flour, or cassava flour, how can I be more aware and protect myself from aflatoxins? The consumer, um, I don't know. I think the, that's a, a very tough a question. Because how can we really avoid the, you know, uh, buying uh, uh, food stuff which are contaminated? Because still, just like the farmer may not actually tell, uh, also consumers may not tell. 
and we also need to remember that the farmers are also consumers. So, um, you see, uh, I think uh, uh, there's this issue of grading, you know, um, even within um, maize grades, when you look at the standard Z, there's grade number one, grade number two, grade number three. But of course, uh, the levels of aflatoxin should not exceed 10 parts per billion in each of those uh, grades. Now, um, I think uh, um, it, uh, to be sincere, a consumer may not actually know when he goes to buy uh, the, you know, the the flour uh, or all the grains uh, from the market. The be the best thing to to do is to ensure that you buy some uh, flour which has been properly packaged. And when you look at the at the maize flour, it should be completely white, you know. Uh, if it is made from um, all grain maize, it may not be completely white. But sometimes you can you can touch and see if it is lumping. Then those are some of the signs of uh, mold, you know, growth. For the ground nuts, for sure, if they are already in a paste form, there's no way you can tell. It is very dangerous. Those who are processing, they are the ones who should actually help the consumer. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if there's anyone else who would like to speak into that, but what you mentioned raises something else, and uh, that is, do we have regulations in place and uh, or international standards? And these regulations, if they are there, are they effective? Are they being effective? Uh, we'll start with Council David Kabanda in this case, because when we speak regulations, this is something that you must be fully engaging with on a daily. By the way, I would want to start with Professor Kaya. <laughs> okay. Please go yeah, ahead. Let's Please go start. ahead. Thank you very much. Um, um, yes, truly, we have the regulations. We have the standards in place. The, you know, um, the Uganda National Bureau of Standards, eh? they say that they has got a uh, Uganda standard for aflatoxin. You know, you know, aflatoxins uh, can be, you can have four types of uh, aflatoxins. You can have af aflatoxin B1, B2, G1, G2. We normally don't want to, to talk about all those, you know, when we are talking to ordinary people, because we know what it means. Now, for aflato total aflatoxin, you know, uh, the, the regulation is 10 parts per billion. Now, this regulation uh, has been harmonized across all East, um, East African, you know, community member states. So, total aflatoxin is 10 parts per billion, and aflatoxin B1 is 5 parts per billion. That is in a, uh, in a food, human food, grains and whatever. But the we also need to remember that the aflatoxins can contaminate animal feeds. If you use maize grains or soya bean or cotton tube cake or, or mukene, this silver fish which is contaminated with aflatoxins, you cannot avoid these toxins in the animal feeds. Actually, we've not been talking about animal feeds. So, in animal feeds, it, the, 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 the law now talks about 20 parts per billion total aflatoxins. The challenge has been in the implementation, in the enforcement of these regulations. Maybe Council Kawanda can uh, continue from there. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, clearly, we have the standards. Um, we have uh, the strategy. But even beyond that, uh, we have the food uh, and Drugs Act. Of course, it is a very old act, but it has provisions which are to the effect that if you offer any product to be sold as food and it is found to be contaminated, you are criminally liable. Then we have uh, the Plant Health Act, which requires the commissioner uh, crop in the Ministry of uh, Agriculture to be in charge of all the, 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 the planting materials and then making sure that there are no organisms, including maybe those uh, uh, mitosins. I'm not a scientist. Uh, uh, infect uh, crops. 
So when you look at the, the, the kind of legal framework and the policy framework, we are not devoid of the legal regulation. No. The problem is elsewhere. Because even when you look at the constitution and then you start with objective 22, they all talk about nutrition, food must be healthy. Then, then you go to rights, including the right to, to, to freedom from inhuman and degrading treatment. Because if you offer anyone food that is uh, contaminated, you are demeaning or you are degrading them. Because uh, even at international level, even here, if it is not safe, then it is not food. If it is not safe, it, you, you are eating some other substance. So when it comes to law, we have all the legal tools. When, when, when you read the Public Health Act, same thing, you must not offer any food substance that is contaminated. Now, you asked about consumers. And... Uh, of course, con this is why in, 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 in civilization, we must have a government with which we enter into what we call a social contract. This is why if people stand and uh, they, they campaign, even if you did not vote for someone, the moment they win, they take over government and you have now entered into a social contract. That in the circumstances of having aflatoxins, uh, me as a, a bystander, me Kabanda as a pancake lover, I'm not supposed to pick every pancake and I take it for testing. No. So long as I go to the shop or to a supermarket and I clearly see that these people have a license, the moment I eat anything, Mr. Government, you'll be responsible. Of course, I can also add those people but but the government must be, you see, professors just said, I didn't even know that every testing you may need uh, 250. Just imagine if you are just a consumer, that when you buy, uh, for example, I love cashew nuts. When I go to buy cashew nuts, uh, maybe I've bought it 15,000. Then you go to government and I require battery. First test is this. Then you spend 250. And sometimes they don't even give you the results immediately. You have to wait. So this is why we have a government over our heads. This is why. So, 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 so the person to solve this problem is Mr. Government. Because Mr. Government has the possibility, has the power, has the authority. Like Professor has said, in fact, one time I had someone who said that when the president was told about aflatoxins, he wondered why the, the ministry and other related or concerned ministries have not solved this problem in Uganda. So you, when you listen to what is being said, you wonder why some leaders have refused. But we shouldn't just lament and lament and lament. I think time has come when we should hold leaders accountable. We may not even hold, uh, maybe, uh, uh, Professor Kaya, you have been in this policy space for a very long time. But for me, I want to even hold local governments accountable because local governments are the, uh, they have, they, they, they are the authority within this particular jurisdiction. Local governments have power under the Local Government Act to do all these things. Local governments have an agriculture officer, a production officer, a nutrition officer. Now, why would you allow produce to come from your district and it is infected or contaminated? Let me stop here for now. Um, I, I, I know, does, please, uh, proceed yes. to speaking to this since you're okay. <laughs> on the end of uh, dealing with consumers i'm sure you must be also having something to add to that this, is, this that, that is, yes um i i think council is correct because local government has a big role to play if the local government does what they did for coffee i think many of our problems will be solved like in my district right now in kasese you will not find a single person drying coffee without a tarpaulin. It's those small measures that would add up to prevent this problem. And um, on the side of the consumer, 
how can the consumer be aware? It's it's really hard to tell, and yeah. like council has said, it's it's government. But under government, it's again UNBS, because if I went to the store, those who shop in supermarkets, I will check for a UNBS logo on the flour I'm buying, and I will hope that the UNBS has checked that flour for different parameters, metal, fortification, or aflatoxins. But I think we all know the capacity of our UNBS. It's because we're talking about aflatoxin now, but the other factors I mentioned, like fortification, uh, companies like Reco Industries or Mandela Millers, if you're producing flour about 20 tons per day, you are mandated to fortify that flour. So you should have fortified maize flour, fortified wheat. But unfortunately, not all companies do that. The government put the, put the law there, it's, it's there, but there's nobody enforcing that law. And the problem now is the companies that are abiding by the law are at a disadvantage. Why? The, that extra cost of fortifying, the fortification is cheap, but the process is expensive. The technology behind fortification is a bit expensive. So the company is incurring extra costs. The flour might be slightly more expensive on the supermarket shelf as compared to the one that is not fortifying. So if government or UNBS was able to help us, the consumers, and make sure that everything on the shelf has been checked for metal, fortification, or for aflatoxin, that way the consumer may be more protected. And uh, yeah, the, the, the issue of testing, council was right. Even if I took my sample to a government lab for testing. The turnaround period alone is not less than 15 days. Sometimes it goes as far as two months. And now as a businessman, I don't have that luxury of time. I can't take my sample, wait for the test result so that I can sell my produce in two months. I would have lost. Now the one that doesn't test will sell. He'll get his money, buy again and sell again. So he's his business is more profitable than the one that is trying to be low abiding. Uh, I think that is uh, for the consumers, like Council said, the groundnuts, it's hard to tell if it has a aflatoxin. Avoid the pest if you can, because what happens is many producers, we keep the good groundnuts for the and sell them as groundnuts, but then the old, the shriveled, the, the, dirt, the dirty ones, we use that to make the pest. So if you can avoid, as a consumer, if you can avoid buying groundnut pest, it will help you avoid the problem of water toxin. Thank you very Thank you. much, Anod. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anod. And uh, Professor? Can I add something? something yes, yes, simple. Professor. I know they have talked about a very important point of um, fortification because now it's the mandatory, you know, uh, there's mandatory fortification of, 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 for maize, maize flour and the wheat flour. Now, one thing that he probably was not mentioned is that he, in addition to causing cancer, aflatoxins can bind important nutrients, you know, in the food. You know, zinc, iron, you know, proteins, etc. Now, if you are going to fortify, you know, maize flour with iron or zinc, and this maize flour has got aflatoxin, you will be wasting time. So we need to fortify flour that is actually free from these toxins. So the effect may not even be uh, only on the on the directories that we have been talking about, the liver cancer, uh, etc. But it can even be on the, that method of, you know, uh, improving the nutritional composition of the maize and wheat flour. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, Professor, we want to find out, in Kenya, there is an act that criminalizes the use of uh, seeds that have not, that are of indigenous seeds. 
in uh, in essence, what that means is that for a farmer to go out and plant anything, they are required to only plant it certified by regulated suppliers. Um, do we have something like this happening in Uganda? I, this is a question I would have wanted to ask also council. Uh, but yes, you can respond and council can also come in along the way. Do we have that in place in Uganda? We have, I think, companies that uh, sell certified seeds or grains, seeds actually uh, for planting. But sometimes you find out that uh, because of the, the, the uh, our loose, you know, uh, enforcement of laws, uh, sometimes the what is certified is not actually right. So you you may buy um, a seeds like a maize of a particular variety, you plant it, but you, what you get is uh, quite different. So we have got certified companies, but I don't. I don't think it's mandatory here that everyone should do a plant certified seed. So the certified seed would now be seed of, of free from any diseases, free from aflatoxins. You know, you know of the required variety, healthy seed, and that will just be assured of 100 percent germination after planting. But sometimes it's not the case. Maybe a uh, council could add to that. Uh, council, are you here? Are you back? It's not on. Okay. Arnold, uh, would you like to speak into that? Um, the issue of the, the, the seed. I, I heard about the seed in Kenya, but I don't think we have the regulation here yet. The regulation that I last heard of was for the, the GMO seed, which was rejected. But as per... The certified seed, I have a personal opinion. I think our farmers should be allowed to use their own seed, the seed that has been used since by their fathers and their grandfathers. Now, a professor might, might object as a professor, but I personally, I think that that seed should be used because... One, because of costs. The cost of the, the seed at home is free. I plant my one acre, I sell, I keep my one kilogram for the next season. The viability, if it was, if it was good seed, it will be, it's viable, it will germinate. As opposed to buying seed every time that I have to plant. Also, in our Ugandan situation, we have a lot of what we call the chupuli. So unfortunately, many farmers okay. have been duped. The chupuli is a fake, fake produce. We, we go to the container village. We buy what we think is certified seed. It's treated, it's red. But you take it back home and plant, and you have a 10% germination rate. So I think it might be too early for Uganda to insist on having that law on of using only certified seed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. At this point, uh, let yes, me... Yes, let me... Add, yes. That, please, Can please, you, please. Yes. Um, for me, I don't have any problem um, whether I use certified seed or indigenous seed or homestead seed. Uh, you see, uh, even if you use a seed which is contaminated with aflatoxin, it does not necessarily mean that the the, 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 the output, the crop, or whatever that you have it will be as contaminated because these toxins are not taken along with the with the, with the crop as it grows. What you want to make sure is you start with a seed that will eventually give you a healthy crop. It's a crop that should be able to withstand this aflatoxin, you know, mold contamination later as it actually grows. So, we have got, of course, the CB Act, uh, I think, which has, to, which he has been talking about all these issues of traditional certified seeds, uh, blah, blah. But, of course, as I said, because of uh, lack of enforcement, it is not actually enforced. But the, the primary purpose of using certified seeds is to ensure that we start with a healthy crop that will be resistant or tolerant to most of these diseases, including the molds that they produce aflatoxins. 
Amazing. Thank you very much, Professor. And uh, we have Joseph at Masanja on standby to share with us his experience of what Tanzania is doing. And uh, we'll also later have Serrano Alusimbi also getting to ask his question. Uh, Joseph at Masanja, if uh, you are there, please, can you tell us what Tanzania is doing? Well, thank you very much. First of all, my name is Joseph Fatima Sanja from Tanzania. I work under the Ministry of Agriculture under the subunit of Agricultural Seeds Agents. So we do production, processing, and distribution of agricultural seeds, the hybrid seeds, but also we deal with uh, production of certified seeds, the OPVs, hybrid, and everything. So talking about aflatoxin, this is not the challenge of Uganda run and Kenya run. It is also the, 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 the devastating problem in our country. The Minister of Agriculture struggling a lot to eradicate this problem to our farmers from the production level up to a uh, table. So what we do in Tanzania, by a little bit experience, first of all, the government's has introduced the three government institutions which is working together. They work in collaboration. We have Tanzania Agricultural Research Institute, we have Agricultural Seed Agents, and we have Tanzania Official Seed Certification Institute. These are the three government institutions working together. So Tanzania Agricultural Research Institute works to uh, discover these breeder seeds, basic seeds, as well as uh, the pre-basic seeds. So after producing these seeds, they send them to agricultural seed agents who do multiplication of seeds to produce uh, seeds which uh, is in quantity that uh, can uh, help many farmers to get uh, this hybrid or OPV seeds. But TOSCI, the Tanzania Official Seed Certification Institution, is there to oversee the entire process of producing seeds. So back to the question that have been raised here. Having an institution like TOSCI is very, very important. We have seen how we deal with this challenge, especially aflatoxin. So one of the challenges that is legislated by TOSC, they legislate the issue of genetic purity of the seeds, but also they legislate the issue of seed purity, including these diseases. So for the company which is allowed by the government to produce as private as private company to support the government producing these seeds. Once Tosk see that most of seed which have been produced, whether by ASA as government institution or private company, is contaminated to aflatoxin or any other disease, whether fungal, bacterial, or virus disease, became rejected by Tosk. And Thereafter, we see uh, some of uh, some of uh, distribution of uh, seeds which is contaminated became prohibited by government, and of course, we reduce rate of infection of most of diseases which can be actually caused by contaminated seeds. So this is very very important, and we deal with from the, I mean, we deal with aflatoxin from the seed supply level. But at the same time, the Minister of Agriculture introduced the aflatoxin board, the board which is dealing specifically with aflatoxin problem in the country. So they have established the laboratory, which is now working to uh, support most of our farmers, especially in the region where many of our farmers produce these crops, especially maize, uh, granite, 
and many other crops which is affected by aflatoxin. So in our country, if you come to Tanzania, the Southern Highland Zone is one of the uh, the area which is actually dominated by farmers who grow these cereal crops. So that laboratory helped farmers to detect whether they are crop are prone to be affected by aflatoxin, all affected by aflatoxin. And this help even uh, export. At export level, we have, of course, TAP, TPHPA, one of the institutions which is regulating the issue of phytosanitary certification at the border or at the seaport or airports. So once this uh, aflatoxin board helps farmers to detect the aflatoxin disease in their crops, they also capac capacitate these farmers to uh, store their crops, but also to know how to deal with uh, aflatoxin case. I appreciate the contribution of Professor. The use of storage, uh, these uh, polyethylene bags, have actually helped our farmers to control the aflatoxin. But also, uh, there leaves a lot of issues under the production section. How to irrigate the crop is one author of the issue, which is uh, uh, very important to be under consideration. Because the rate of infection of fungal disease appears mostly during production, especially once you select improper method of irrigation. So these are some of the issues that we do in Tanzania to mitigate the situation of uh, aflatoxin case. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Josephat, for your contribution. Mr. Serrano, um, would you like to speak into our discussion tonight? Mr. Serrano, Walusi. Hello? Can, can you hear me now? Hello? Some of us can hear. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, uh, thank you for this, uh, this discussion. Uh, it's really uh, educative for some of us. Now, um, I had a couple of uh, questions, uh, but I'll try to be brief and, uh, and put them across. Um, I had, uh, I think it was Arnold, uh, Mr. Arnold Ravogo, who talked about the, the work that uh, I think the local government in his area in Kasese is doing. Uh, I thought uh, the issue of local government was uh, mainly one being, uh, of course, not well funded and therefore uh, doing the work of the police for policing these farmers to make sure that they are doing the right, uh, the right, the right things so that m many of their produce is not uh, uh, in infected uh, or affected. By, by, by these aflatoxins uh, so that the consumers can have a, a better end product to, 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 to consume. I wonder how that is being managed in Kasese that other local governments are failing to do, uh, for one. And then, uh, I, then also the issue of, uh, like you said, we have all these things. You walk into a supermarket, you want to buy porridge, you want to buy... Uh, Kaunga and uh, the the package really has UNBS. I don't know how how that is is policed because some of sometimes I look at this packaging and I think I'll just go to Nasa Road and and put up a, and, and and print a package with the UNBS uh, logo. I don't know if they are, they are the, the 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 responsibility is on UNBS. Is it on the is it on the on, on, on the supermarket where I'm buying, because if UNBS comes and does a spot check, and then you say, okay, where did you buy this? And where, who, who's the supplier of this or that? I, I, it, it's, it seems like it's, it's, it's really a, a dead game for the end consumer. 
uh, especially if people are not going to go through those hoops uh, because they are either because of expense or delays. Like I think some one of the speakers talked about, and I even read, I think, today's papers or something, where you have trucks stuck at the border for, for, for two months because of testing. Uh, the turnaround time is really, it takes, it takes so much, so much, and therefore can, it's not good business for someone who has taken loans to do uh, maybe an export or importing things. So I, I don't know how this can be addressed. Thank you. Um, the moderator may not be online unless he's back. Okay, this is Arnold. Can you hear me, Wais? Lucimbi? Yes. Yes, Mr. yes, yes. I can. Uh, thank you for the, for the questions and, uh, and also for the previous speaker. I, I think the issue we Uganda faces is the same issue that Tanzania faces. And uh, it's good that you mentioned the border issues because it's besides after toxin causing health problems, it has also caused national problems. The, we have had conflicts with our neighbors because of aflatoxin. I think it was in 2021 when our border with the Nile Kenya was closed. And one of the issues was aflatoxin, green. But also recently, like you mentioned, uh, at the Elagu border crossing with South Sudan, we had um, over 1,700 tons of our maize stuck at the border. Actually, not stuck. What happened was the maize crossed into South Sudan. The South Sudan government held it. They tested it, and it failed for aflatoxin. So it was going to be confiscated, and our traders were going to lose millions. I think the government approximated it to about $2 million dollars which is about maybe seven, eight billion Uganda shillings. So there were negotiations between our UNBS and their South Sudan NBS. It took, government, it took the president to intervene. And when he did, our trucks were returned back to on our border, the, our border side, and they were still held. Then the UNBS and the East African community went back tested the grain, and a lot of it failed for aflatoxin. So that is a big issue. The traders lost, Uganda lost, South Sudan lost a source of food. And um, yeah, it's, a, it, it's, it's really bigger than just Ugandan farmers. So again, what would have happened would have been UNBS, again, I think I... I have to insist, UNBS has a big part to play. UNBS should have tested this maze before it reached the border. Am I still on? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, it should have gone before it reached the border. And uh, there was a, a traders meeting about a month ago in Boyagere, and this was discussed. But the traders claimed ignorance of aflatoxin. They said the government should have been able to test it before it went. And then in came the issue of disposal. What happens to the maize that has been, that has failed the test? The one that slightly passed was returned to, to the traders. I mean, two months later, they already had a few losses. And another issue was even in two months, the one that had been good had already been contaminated. So most of it was not passing. Now the problem is all this maize is going to go back into circulation. If not in human food, it will go back to animal feeds. And like we have seen that in animal feeds, it will go to your chicken feed, dog feed, and all these animals are susceptible to aflatoxins. Um, cows can, can suffer from aflatoxin and the milk in return would have aflatoxin. I've heard of dogs dying of aflatoxin injury, I mean, liver failure. Another issue that we, Walusim, Mr. Walusimbi raised on local government, I, 
Yeah, he mentioned local governments, but it was more of a wish for them to be more involved. Yes, they're poorly funded, but, and I, I have to give this to the Coffee Development Authority. Maybe they are better funded, but the work they have done in many regions, including Kasese, they have, the laws are strict. If you're, if you're found not drying on the top lane, you will be penalized. And all the farmers in Kasese follow that law. So if the local government was supported, I think would have a better situation than we have now. Um, regarding the packaging um, in the supermarkets, when the, the onus is on the supermarket to have all its products UNBS certified. And the mandate of UNBS is to make sure that all the products carrying its logo are tested. So if the UNBS had capacity, it should be able to go into the supermarkets, pick samples of the products that it certifies and ensure that they are still following the law. Now, the issue that you mentioned of going and making your own bag and putting your own logo, that is criminal. And uh, I'm not sure what the fine is, but UNBS can arrest you for doing that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. Yes, Professor. Just a little bit. Just what I can add on is that um, as far as the... Uh, Yes, Professor Aspas. As far as the uh, local government is concerned, there are some districts which have uh, just uh, um, annulled their trade. There are some districts which have formed the um, ordinances and bylaws, you know, regarding handling of their produce like a maize. And uh, that they find you, um, you know, drying maize on their ground, the people stupid, and uh, the, the, the owner will be uh, penalized, will be punished. So I think that some of those, you know, bylaws can be uh, established and they can work. As long as they are not affected by politics. Because recently when we um, when we are trying to um, teach people, we went to local government, they are trying to talk about uh, food systems transformation, including, uh, you know, um, use of laws, policies, you know, and the institutional framework. They mentioned that you know um, some of these laws or policies have not worked well. They have been inter interfered by politics, and some of these uh, you know our politicians uh, fear to talk to people because of uh, you know vote cheap politics. Don't no. touch my voters because they are supposed to do A B C D. So those who are supposed to enforce you know some of these ordinances, you know may not even um, uh, do so because of fearing. You know, to lose, you know, a vote. So as long as that doesn't disappear and then it, you know, they live and replace, they are seen they can be enforced. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your submission. I see we've been joined by uh, Agnes Chirabo. If um, you are there, could you uh, we are the tail end of the space, but maybe uh, you could tell us what you wanted or something that you would have wanted to pass on to our uh, audience for this evening, and then we'll be wrapping this up in the next five minutes. Uh, Agnes, are you there? Agnes, are you there? From Food Rights Alliance. David Muhumza on uh, tweet on X, you mentioned that also rice and cassava towards uh, the maturity. I think you meant that uh, also rice and cassava are prone to aflatoxins towards maturity. Thank you so much for your contribution to tonight's discussion. Uh, we appreciate you being part of this. And uh, we also have, uh, I've already mentioned Serrano Walusimbi's comment. 
let's see who else has a comment. Um, I think that's pretty much it for tonight. I maybe one more time. Agnes Chirabo, Executive Director of Food Rights Alliance, can you hear us? And uh, could you say something briefly to our audience? Okay, um, sorry, I've all along been muted by the host. Good evening, uh, dear participants. I regret joining the chat space late. I was, a mod I was moderating a session here at the events of the African Union to commemorate the African Day for Food Security and Nutrition in Irusaka. Uh, sincere apologies for coming in late, but I could only tell this meeting that the issues of aflatoxins, the issues of food safety have dominated the conversation as a, a barrier to intra-Africa trade, uh, here in Lusaka, where member states of the African Union have convened since Monday this week to discuss about the issues of trade, but also the issues of food and nutrition security in the continent and as to whether Africa can really feed itself and what is expected of us. So I bring you greetings from the member states, uh, people from the various member states of the African Union, that have candidly been discussing the barriers to having safe, healthy, and nutritious diets. We have concluded, and among the key messages and takeaways that we have uh, shared in the declaration collectively is the issue of the investment in the quality infrastructure. It is no longer a complaint. It is no longer a concern. It is no longer something that we sit here and lament about. It is something that we have to wake up and invest collectively, but also individually. We need to start asking ourselves questions about food safety. When we are talking about the food quality infrastructure, how much have you invested you as a person in your personal food safety infrastructure? I think let us start it from that end. In your house, the kind of plates that you're eating from, the, hind, the kind of pans, saucepans that you're using to cook, the kind of storage facilities for your food that you have in your house. And then we start moving into the community and then we go to the country and then eventually we become the entire Africa, the issue of the food safety infrastructure. The other issue that has also emerged is the issue of the quality culture our behaviors, do we have that civic consciousness when it comes to safety over food? Are we conscious when we are serving food? Do we ask ourselves questions when we are buying food? Do we ask ourselves questions when we are handling food as food handlers, as food traders, as food processors? The question is, me and you that are on this chat this evening, do we have that culture? All we Malaga eat, we Malaga buy, we Malaga manage, we Malaga, we do not care. And it becomes worse when it comes to, uh, to trade. And lastly, what I could also share that has emerged here, food safety is here and now. If it is not food, we have all collectively ag agreed that if it is not safe, it isn't food. It isn't food once the food is being contam contaminated and condemned. It is not fit for even animal feed. And worst still, it is not even fit for a fertilizer that it can go into the food system. Now, that Africa is looking forward to feeding each other. If the people in Uganda have been compromising, the people in Sudan are not going to compromise, the people in Kenya are not going to compromise, the people in Rwanda are not going to compromise or even Cameroon or elsewhere in Africa. So the area we stand up yesterday to address the quality and food safety issues, the better. Because food safety is going to become a poverty issue. Those that are trading, that are producing quality food shall be able to access the various market opportunities. And of course the opposite, is true, but also food safety are going to become a healthy 
issue, a very big health issue than we had ever thought before. But food safety is also going to become a hunger and malnutrition issue at the face of our minds. So I'm happy that uh, you people, you have been here and uh, uh, exchanging uh, this knowledge and experiences. And I'm happy with people like Professor Kaya that have invested the rest of their academic career on an issue that was not an issue the many years they have worked on this particular issue. Many of us are just sensational. Something comes on board, we jump on it. It gets off the radar, we get off it. So I cannot um, get out of this space without appreciating people like him and the colleagues that he works with. But also the organizers of this, this Twitter space, please let us continue talking about food safety. Let us talk about ending aflatoxins in our food system everywhere, in church, in school, in the tax parks, everywhere. Let us crusade and preach the gospel according to food safety because if it is not safe, it's not food. I submit and I apologize once again. Thank you so much, Agnes. I'm going to ask one of our listeners in, uh, to ask you a question, and that is Mongadi. Please ask your question right now, um, and uh, we end the space. So, Mongadi, please ask your question, and uh, Executive Director Agnes Jarrow will definitely respond. Well, I'm not going to ask a question, but I'll make a comment. I'll make a comment. I'm in the, in the United States in a small country called Iowa. A country with three point, a country with three point two million people, a country mm. that that feeds the world, a country that I think is a lead research, research country in agriculture. I'm just disappointed that we keep discussing as Africa all the time. We discuss things and we don't implement anything. Recently, Ugandans were here and I was telling them, "Look, these people are cutting hay." They are going to feed animals during winter. We are now in winter, but we are a lead producer of meat. We are a lead producer of milk. This country here, no milk. No, no family takes milk that is not certified. Farmers produce milk here, but public health, no family, even a farmer himself does not take his milk. The milk must be certified by public health, food and, and drug administration. So there are things that Africa must just wake up. Now these people are going to be without, without the sun. We are going to be in snow for six months. But check what Iowa does to the world, feeding 202 countries of the world. Africa has sunshine and it's wet and dry. We just speak. I'm disappointed. I mean, I get hurt. Recently, we're talking about milk. And I'm like, but Ugandans don't have a market. You're talking about market for milk when Ugandans don't have milk. You have not supplied milk to universities. You have not supplied milk to schools. You have not supplied milk to hospitals. But you're saying we don't have market for milk. Something must be done. Ugandans must wake up or Africa. We are shame. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mungadi, for your submission. And uh, we cannot take this any further. It's been a wonderful one and 30 minutes of your time with us this evening. We've had the best, I believe, of uh, uh, speakers for this evening and uh, such a great audience as well contributing to the discussion. We always have these uh, spaces happening every month and uh, please look out for more of these as we keep bringing up the topics. Uh, for more information of what we do and uh, how you can be able to get in touch with us, simply follow us on our Twitter handle, that is at Africa AgriNet, or go to YouTube, you'll be able to see some of the shows we've done, and you'll be able to learn from the farmers we've visited. We thank you so much once again for joining us. For now, let me wish you all a wonderful evening, a wonderful day, depending on which state or which country you're in. We thank you. God bless you.